Welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is author and athlete Brad Kearns discovering ways to be healthy, fit, and happy in hectic, high-stress modern life. So let's slow down and take a deep breath, take a cold plunge, and expertly balance that competitive intensity with an appreciation of the journey. That's the theme of the show. Here we go. So when the doctor told me, he said, you have something very serious. He said, are you this kind of person that likes to push through pain? And I kind of probably was like, yeah, I, you know, I'm from Texas. Of course I push through pain. You know, like you said, hook them horns, we're tough. And he said, well, you need to stop right now. It's important to make sure that you're listening to your body. I think for anybody that has chronic pain, especially with people that suffer from CRPS, To me, I kind of view it as like the monster that lives in my foot. I think a gift that I've been given is, you know, I was always a very independent and considered myself a humble person. Let me tell you, this whole experience has humbled me and I think it's important to remain humble because when you're humbled, you continue to grow. Let us give thanks to the show sponsors. These are great products and services. Check them out. It's so difficult to make the cut. Almostheaven.com for beautiful compact home use sauna kits. Ancestralsupplements.com for grass-fed organ meats in a capsule. Easy. DNAfit.com genetic testing delivering comprehensive diet and exercise recommendations wildidea.com grass-fed sustainable buffalo beyond organic and the primal blueprint online multimedia mastery courses I'm your host. Learn more at the links on my homepage, bradkearns.com. I also have a new button called Shopping with Brad for other cool stuff at bradkearns.com. And here we go with the show. This is Brad. I want to tell you about my life-changing acquisition of a personal home-use sauna. I have a 6 by 6 barrel sauna in my backyard, ready-made heat therapy, a fabulous unit from Almost Heaven. Check out their website. You can very affordably order your own sauna for installation in your backyard or garage and have a sauna experience, the fabulous health benefits accruing from exposure to hot temperatures. Get that sweat going. These are beautiful, traditional dry barrel saunas where you splash the water on the rocks, go in there and relax. It's become a social centerpiece at my home. People traveling from far and wide to come check out the barrel sauna, turn the dial or set the timer and walk in to 200 degrees in the Caribbean seas. For some reason, people like to come to the sauna more than my cold tub. Go figure. Check out almostheaven.com and their beautiful natural wood designs. And pretty soon, surprisingly affordable, you will be in the home sauna business. Hi, listeners. I'm pleased to welcome Amberly Lago to the Southern California studios of the podcast here in my former hood of Woodland Hills. Thank you, Cousin Babby, for introducing us. She said, yeah, you should get this girl on your podcast. Went over to the website and saw such a powerful story and an amazing journey that she's been on. I think it could possibly change your life, hopefully change your perspective and drift you in the direction of all those important things we hear about today, like expressing gratitude and being mindful. This is the real deal. And she is a fantastic work in progress. She makes a great point to say that she's trying hard every day, not perfect, not a brushed up, glossed over story, but something that you would best call as her book title, True Grit and Grace turning tragedy into triumph. Amberly is an athletic lady, former professional dancer, elite athlete, fitness trainer. She was driving down the road in her Harley about eight years ago, right here in the Ventura Boulevard, San Fernando Valley, had a horrible accident, 
They wanted to amputate her leg. She refused. She endured 34 surgeries with plates, pins, and sheer will. Eventually, her leg was spared, but she contracted a very difficult disease called chronic regional pain syndrome. It is known as the suicide disease because it's nonstop pain, often driving people to end it. And she battles with this every day and has come so far. I can't wait for you to join us and listen to this powerful story, something to reflect upon and gain inspiration from. Here comes Amberly Lago, author of True Grit and Grace, Turning Tragedy into Triumph. Like that. We are talking, Amber Lee. Thanks, Thanks for coming over to the Southern Cal <laughs> studios of Get Over Yourself podcast. Usually when I'm getting ready for a podcast, I'll write down some questions and try to figure out where this is going. But when I saw your story, I'm just like blown away at what you've done and wh- where you've come from. So I think we uh, oh, we got to talk about this thing. Yeah, oh, thank you. We, we're, you're starting out riding a Harley in L.A., which you know I was a bike rider in L.A. and um, it's not a it's it's not an easy thing to do. And you had a terrible misfortune. This is now eight years ago. Uh, yeah, you know, there's that saying: if you're riding a bike, uh, it's not it's not if you're going to go down, it's when, because most of the time, you know, it's not, it doesn't matter how careful or how safe of a rider you are. Most of the time people don't see you. And so it's risky, especially in a place where there's so much traffic and, you know, yeah, I was coming home from work and I had an SUV that I guess didn't see me and made a left right into me. So I was T-boned. And that kicked off a long series of surgeries, medical problems? Yeah. Well, you know, in the blink of an eye, your whole life can change. You know, it was a holiday weekend. Life was good. I just finished training clients. I had run my best uh, time that day. I had ran 11 miles of my best time and I was going to go and enjoy a weekend. And man, boy, things change really quick. And when I was hit, you know, I, I, people ask me, you know, I just did an interview a couple of days ago and the lady goes, well, so did you feel it? And I was like, oh yeah, I felt it. She goes, but do you remember it? I was like, yes, I remember every detail. Um, unfortunately, I, I remember, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this. When you're riding a motorcycle, you drive def- or you ride defensively. You kind of look out for the other person and make sure they see you. And I could have sworn this guy saw me and I thought we had made eye contact and there was nothing I could do really other than kind of let off my clutch and try to jump off my bike. And thank goodness I did try to jump off because my lower leg took the brunt of the impact. And then I was thrown about 30 feet. And the scary part was, you know, when I was sliding across, I couldn't, I couldn't tell what I, like, was I sliding into oncoming traffic? I didn't know where I was going. And so I just tried to tuck into a ball and I was thinking, please don't let another car hit me. Please don't let another car hit me. And when I stopped and I looked down at my leg, I mean, I immediately felt pain, but it's amazing what your mind, what goes through your mind. Like I, I I thought, oh my gosh, I looked, my leg was just crumbled into pieces. And one of my first thoughts was, oh boy, I'm going to have to train clients on crutches for a while. And then I thought, oh man, my husband's going to be so pissed at me because I have a pulled pork sandwich in my backpack and and it's his brand new backpack. And I didn't ask for permission to use it, but, you know, and then I re- I started realizing the magnitude of just how serious it was when I saw other people walking up to me and their reactions. And it that's what and thank God, you know, I had a guardian angel, uh, I think, because there was a guy that immediately made a tourniquet on my leg because my femoral artery was actually actually severed. And I didn't even know at the time that how fast you can bleed out from uh, an artery being severed like that. So thank God he, you know, was there. Oh, sure. Cause I think the average person's going to stand around 
and say, are you okay? Should I dial 911? And all these minutes go by. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of occasions where a random person happens to be, you know, the next car is a, is a, uh, a nurse practitioner coming over and uh, that good fortune has pr- probably, probably saved you at that point in the street. And actually, um, and you know, sometimes you never know if people are going to stop, are they going to help or what are they going to do? And, and luckily I had a, a nurse that came over too. And, you know, there were, there were people, they didn't run over to me. They kind of walked slowly. And there was one lady that actually fainted. And when the nurse kneeled down to me, she grabbed my hands and she was like, breathe with me. I need you to breathe. And I was just, of course, screaming out cuss words and thinking, oh, my Methodist mother is not going to be proud of me. And then I would scream out cuss words and then, you know, call my husband. But she really helped me get through that as well. That's important at that time because of the stress response, right? You want to mitigate the the the, the state of the body going into shock or uh, getting overwhelmed with whatever it is, your panic or your anger. Mm-hmm. She wants you to stay calm, mm-hmm. I guess, get your get your heart rate down and your respiration down or something. Yeah, yeah. What's weird is that you remember all this because I, I feel like it's more common when people have a terrible accident, they they don't remember. Oh. They just wake up in the hospital or something. Yeah, this is kind of so trippy true. that you're worried about the sandwich in the backpack. It's crazy what goes through your mind. And and I remember every detail of it. In fact, one of the first things I told my husband when he showed up to the scene, because apparently all of a sudden his phone started ringing like crazy. And he was like, well, I guess I better answer this because my his phone, all these people, bystanders started calling that number that I was yelling oh. out. And so when he showed up to the scene, one of the first things I said to him was, I had an appointment to go see my friend who's a physical therapist because I had a knot in my calf from running. And I said, can you please call him and tell him I'm not going to make it to my appointment today? And he just looked at me like, uh, I don't think we need to worry about that right now. <laughs> but I remember um, everything from the accident, you know, riding in the ambulance. You know, I was strapped to a gurney and this is how crazy I was, or am, I guess. I, <laughs> I had on a brand new hot pink Lululemon jacket. It was my favorite it's $140. jacket. It's $140. Please don't rip it up. They started cutting it. And yeah. I was like, no, 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 don't cut my jacket. It's new. And I, I can take it off. And then I was trying to take off my jacket. And then they started administer, you know, uh, giving me an IV. And I said, well, wait a minute. What are you giving me? They said, well, we're going to give you some morphine. And I said, you can't. I'm allergic to that. I'll go into anaphylactic shock. And so thank goodness I was very, um, you know, I wasn't knocked out um, because that could have made things a lot worse. Mm. And um, the last thing I remember before they put me under was um, I was in the ER in Northridge and the room, the hospital. The ER was just chaotic because my husband is a cop and the brotherhood of the police force is, you know, word travels fast. And when they found out that I had gone down, the whole room was just full of cops. And I heard this like crying, like wailing. I didn't know what the noise was. Oh, what is that? And it was my husband. And I had, he's a first responder. I had never seen him cry. I'd never even seen him get like a little misty eyed. And here he was like crying uncontrollably. And I just yelled across the room, Johnny, I need you to get over here and be strong for me now. And he came over and he held my hand. And I think I said that even more so like, I was scared. Am I going to like, in the ambulance ride, I was looking at the paramedics for some, like, kind of like, like, am I going to be okay? Is there any, eye? they wouldn't even give me any eye contact. And so I thought, oh my gosh, they're not even looking at me. Am I going to die? Like, is it that bad? And so I think at this point, I was like, am I dying? Like, what's going on? And so I needed to know that he was going to like be strong to take care of our daughters that's the last thing I remember before they had to put me in induced coma 
because um, I was going into shock and my vital signs, everything was shutting down basically. That's from the bleeding, uh, from the, the leg injury mostly? Yeah, mostly the leg injury. You know, I'd hit my head. I had road rash. Thank goodness it wasn't as bad because of that backpack. It was That mm. saved my back. Mm. But um, most of the injury was to my leg and my foot was actually completely off, only on by hanging on by skin. What does your husband say about that now where he broke down and, and of, of the most the least likely people to do that. He's a first responder. This is his life. Mm -hmm. You would think that he could hold it together, but it's so different when, when it's a loved one rather than doing his job. He's in a whole different mindset, I guess. You know, it's in, it's interesting. My family was just in town this past week and my first cousin was visiting and my husband said, Oh my goodness. Um, it's so good to see you. The last time you were here was right after Amberly's accident. And he goes, I'll never forget. I was by myself one, it was, you know, late at night and I was looking at over, over the hospital bills. And I was so worried, like, how am I going to do this? What, how am I going to pay this? And my cousin showed up. And as my husband was remembering this, he got like a little teary eyed. And like I said, my husband does not get emotional. And I thought just him kind of thinking about that moment where my husband showed up to like give him support, brought him back to that time and that place of it was a really difficult time. Even though I went down, I was going through all of this. He had to like, he was my rock. He had to like take care of my youngest daughter who was only two years old at the time. So it was a really, it was a really hard time. Um, so this just isn't just my story or what I went through. This is really our story because it's, you know, our family that went through it. And I think by sharing my story, it, it not only has helped me heal, I have really wanted to reach out to others so that they know that, you know, even by showing all my scars, I remember the first time I, I showed my scars in public, you know, my husband was like, oh, don't you want to cover that up? It's not probably good for your skin grafts or this and that. And, and it took a lot of courage to start to show my mangled and deformed leg. But, you know, when I show my scars, it shows others that they too will heal. You know, and so that's why um, I think when we share our story, it allows us the opportunity to build a community of people. And that's how we start to claim our resilience. So your story gets a little more complex because the to tell us about the the journey of the surgeries and the ongoing battle. Well, um, you know, it took when I first woke up from a coma, they said the first thing they told me was they're going to amputate my leg. And being a former professional dancer and a fitness trainer, that was probably one of the worst things that I could hear. And I thought, no, you're not taking my leg. No. And they said, they said, well, no, you have a 1% chance of saving it. Um, there's just other than a war wound, this is like the worst um, injury we've seen, we're going to have to amputate it. And it took them 34 surgeries, but piece by piece, after three and a half months in the hospital, the first time they were able to put my leg back together. You know, it started with um, just seeing if they could put my femoral, reattach my femoral artery. And so that I can sit here now and tell you that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was going through all these surgeries and my pain wasn't getting any better. And, you know, growing up in Texas, it was like, you know, it, we had sayings like get her done and suck it up. And I, that was, you Hook know, them horns, yeah, all that stuff. it was like, I was <laughs> that, exactly. And I was like, I was determined to walk again when doctors said that I would be in a wheelchair forever. Um, I was determined to run again when I was told I would never run again. And I was so happy to be upright and on crutches for the first time. 
Because I went from being, you know, in the best shape of my life to being bedridden with bed sores, depending on someone to carry a bedpan for me. So when I was upright and went in for a doctor's appointment, I was diagnosed with a nerve disease called, um, it used to be called RSD or regional um it's now called CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. And it is a disease of the sympathetic nervous system, which leaves you in constant chronic pain. It's dubbed the suicide disease because it's ranked highest on the pain scale and there's no known cure. Um, so when the doctor told me, he said, you have something very serious. He said, are you the kind of person that likes to push through pain? And I kind of probably was like, yeah, I, you know, I'm from Texas. Of course I pushed through pain. You know, like you said, hook them horns. We're tough. And he said, well, you need to stop right now. You need to get back in your wheelchair. You are going to be permanently disabled and your life will not be the same. And I was pretty much stopped listening after <laughs> like never be the same. And I would never be able to have a normal life and I was devastated. And when I started to, I didn't know exactly what RSD was um, or CRPS was. I had never heard of that. Um, and the only thing that stuck out to me was the suicide disease. I was like, how can this be named the suicide disease? What is this? And so they're naming it that because the pain is so bad that it drives people to, to end it because it's just not getting better. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What about the that initial demand that you wanted to preserve your leg? Um, so you're you're going against, I, I guess, the routine medical decision in that case would say too much hassle. Mm -hmm. Let's just amputate. And so you chose and demanded another path for them to follow. And I guess that's why there was the thirty four surgeries because it was it was such a big objective to to try to save the leg. Yeah, it it wasn't like my leg was just broken. It was like if you took a cracker and broke it, that's a break. My leg was if you took a saltine cracker and crumbled it. And it was just in pieces. So they had to piece by piece. They would go in and first clean it up, then go in and stabilize it, then, you know, uh, put put together my tibia, then try to put together part of my fibula. Then, you know, it was just piece by piece. Oh, these are the separate surgeries. They were all separate surgeries. And the reason being that's too much to do at once or something. Too much to do at once. In fact, um, after about a year, maybe a little less than a year after I was out of the hospital the first time, um, I noticed that I my leg was giving me a lot of pain, and I noticed it was bowing in the middle, like it was bending. And I went in, and I asked the doctor about it, and he was like, well, we need to do an x-ray. And there was a non-union in the tibia, and the hardware only lasts as long as you, your bone either grows or the hardware starts to break. It's And I unfortunately broke the titanium. So they had to go in and take the broken pieces out and put a rod in. And that surgery, just that one surgery, was a 10-hour surgery to take the broken pieces out. And that doctor could have so easily given up, like, well, the rod's not going in through, it's, you know, we're just gonna give up on this. Let's go ahead and amputate. Um, and then it was another surgery just to go in and close my leg up again. So it was a lot. But even after all of these surgeries and I was diagnosed with CRPS, um, I went in to my pain doctor one day and I said, you know what, can you just amputate it? Can you just chop it off? It's given me too much pain. I can't handle it. Can you just amputate it after all of this? And he said, we can't do that. He said, you have CRPS um, or regional sympathetic dystrophy, the RSD. And it's in your sympathetic nervous system. If we cut it off, you're still going to feel the pain. It's coming from your, your sympathetic nervous system. And so um, I always thought, well, what if they would have amputated in the beginning? And they said, there's no way of knowing mm -hmm. if they would have. And, and, you know, if you spend your whole life, I remember um, when I wrote my book, 
Uh, my mom was one of the first persons I let her read it and said, can you read this? Let me know if you're okay with some of the things I'm saying, because I knew it would be hard for her to read about the sexual abuse that I experienced in this and that. And she said, well, if you could just write, if I would have known, would I would have done that. And I said, you know, this book isn't about woulda, coulda, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda. It's about this happens and what do you do from here? And that's what I thought about, you know, when I was getting caught up in that thinking of, well, what if I would have amputated it? It's like, you know, we really, we have to start where we are, use what we have and do what we can and and go from there. Um, if you get caught up in thinking, oh, what if I would have done this? You get stuck. Um, or in my case, I started getting depressed. So I think, you know, you, it, for me, I don't compare my past life to my present I or my past accomplishments to my present. I really focus on what I can do now um, and move forward from there. And I think by doing that and being in a place of gratitude for what I can do, um, I'm able to have a life uh, filled with joy. And even though I have, you know, something called the suicide disease, I'm able to have a life filled with happiness. And that's one of the things that I want others to um, to know and to be inspired is to claim their resilience that and and use these different tools that I have kind of created and developed through my journey to help keep me in a place of joy and happiness. And there we have the secret to life. Thank you, listeners. That's the end of the show and the podcast. You can go home and never play another, never push play on another button. That's it right there, Amberly. I mean, it's just beautiful. And it, I, I, I want to ask, why is it so difficult for people to discard the woulda, coulda, shoulda when we're talking not about this incredible medical and, and life or death ordeal, but oh, I should have taken the other job because I would have got stock options and then I'd be rich. I mean, we go through life mm -hmm. just with those voices all the time. I'm still getting together with my my buddies from high school and they were all runners and we were talking about the meet 37 years ago where you took off on the third lap and that was the gap you made and you won and I should have gone and, and stayed on your back and then I would have set my best time. You know, we, we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. stuff and rehash anything that has to do, anything of regret. And for some reason, it seems like we get a payoff in daily life to talk this way. Yeah, I mean... I, th I thought in the beginning, like, well, what if I would have stayed at work? What if I stayed at the gym for five more oh, minutes? That's brutal. I'm, I'm feeling know? sick just thinking about all that stuff. You yeah. know, and it's yeah. like, no, if you really, one of the hardest things for me to do is, one of the hardest things is to be in the moment and be present and focusing on, because, you know, we can get caught up in the past and get caught about and, and get you know, worried or anxious about the future. But if we just try to be in the moment, we can have such a, a, a stress-free life, mm. you know, or as little stress as possible. And yeah, it's, you know, I could drive myself crazy thinking about all the what ifs or if I could have, or if I would have, and you can just drive yourself crazy. Or in my case, I was spiraling myself down into a depression. So I had to change things. You were, you were spiraling yourself down into depression, not necessarily because of the pain, but because of your thinking. Is that what you're saying? Um, I think dealing with the pain is one thing. And I think those voices in, in my head anyway, boy, they can just be negative. Like there can be some serious negative self-talk. And I try to nip it in the bud and mm. change my thinking to... Um, you know, cause it's hard, it's hard waking up and not knowing how bad my, how bad my pain's going to be. And I have people ask me all the time, well, you've healed from your surgeries and now you feel okay. Right. And I'm like, no, I have pain every day. And I just had someone ask me, I just did another interview and they asked me, um, well, so you're not in pain anymore. And I know she had just told me she had had dental work and she had a toothache. And I said, well, 
No, I'm in pain. I said, imagine that toothache. I said, but it's in my foot mostly, and it's every day. I said, so I've had to really practice some health, a healthy mindset, uh, really being, uh, you know, it's mindfulness. So much about it is mindfulness and being in a good headspace. And I've had to create this whole toolbox of a list of things that I have got to go down to. I wish I could tell people that are in chronic pain, if you do this one thing, you're going to feel better. It's a list of things for me. It's, you know, it is, but mostly it's a, it's a physical mental and spiritual journey and mindset about being as physically as healthy as I can be, spiritually connected, and mentally having that healthy mindset. So if you go off track a little bit, like you have an overly stressful day because they forgot to put your daughter in the right class in in (laughs) elementary school and you had to go meet with the principal and then you uh, got into a traffic jam and then this happened and that happened and you're off your A game, um, I, I imagine you have good days and bad days. Mm-hmm. And so this toolbox that you created, this, you know, the, the, just, just hearing these, uh, the terminology that you use is very empowering and you, you're on to some, that's why I loved your story is like, you're, you're hitting these secrets and, and not saying that it's super easy and it's fun and I'm better now, like we watch in the movies, but that you're, you're into this engagement every single day and, and using your tools. Thank you. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm really excited. I get to go speak to the RSDSA conference, which is the um, conference. It's been a, it's annual conference, and it's an organization that's been established for thirty years to give support and sometimes grants to people who have CRPS. And I was really like, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, this is what I've always wanted. I'm going to be their keynote speaker. And I was so excited. And then I went to that place of that mind talk and I went to fear like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be speaking to these people. What if I don't say the right thing? And I'm like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not an expert in anything. And I, I, I'm not an expert in what to do when you're in pain. I just say, hey, look, I get it. I'm in pain every day. Maybe some of these tools will help you. Maybe you have something that will help me. But I think um, when you build a community of people who are going through similar things, and you know what? Pain can be, to look at me, you see my scars and it looks like my leg hurts. But we, I'm talking about any kind of pain, whether it's physical or whether it's emotional, we all go through our challenges. And if we come together and build a community That is a key for, I think, the start to build resilience. And it's not something that you do. Okay, I'm resilient and let's start the day. It's no, I have to wake up every day and it's every day deciding that, you know, my day could be good and my pain could be okay. Or like you said, I could find out that my daughter doesn't have the teacher that, that I wanted her to have, or I did that, you know, step mill a little too fast and my leg is on fire. Well, what can I do next? Mm -hmm. What can I do? And I've learned sometimes, you know, I, I was never the type of person who would take any rest and I had to learn it's okay to rest, just not quit, you know, just, just not quit. Just resting means that, you're recovering. And that's exactly what you're supposed to do. We're meant to have this balance in life where we work hard, play hard. um, We have rest and recovery. And that's just not, that's something I had to learn because I wasn't brought up that way. I was brought up as, you know, running track. And my coach was like, in Texas, it was like, go big or go home. And if you're going to throw up on the track, you're dead meat. So throw up off the track and then keep running, you know? (laughs) And that was training in the hot Texas sun and a hundred percent humidity. And, um, being a dancer, I was taught to ignore my dog, uh, ignore my pain and just keep dancing. It didn't matter if your feet were bloody or what was going on. It was like, you just keep going. And so I learned the hard way that it's very important to have that awareness and listen to your body because, you know, it starts to whisper 
at first. <sighs> then it will start to scream. Are you sure scream. you want to keep dancing? Are you people sure? Don't, people don't realize the dance. When we go see a beautiful dance performance and we think, oh, how cute. They're, they're the ballerinas or even the modern dance people. We don't realize the level of athleticism and also how hard the training is and how much the injury rate is. I remember reading something that um, for youth, it was like the injury rate of all the sports and football was second. And really? number one, uh, number one was um, competitive cheerleading. It's the number wow. one most injury prone injury rate of any sport. Wow. Yeah. Poor kids. I know. And yeah. you know what? I was mascot in school because oh. I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted to do. So I choreographed for the cheerleaders and then I got to like dress up in a costume and dance. What was your mascot? What <laughs> I was, was the, uh, I was the a lion. A I was lion. a lion and I either like freaked little kids out or they loved me. <laughs> Nothing like a big furry lion mascot coming towards your kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mercy. So, so many of us suffer from that syndrome of, overworking and not resting and the cultural uh, baseline here is that we celebrate hard work and we say how are you and you say busy busy oh my gosh i'm slammed and oh wow that it's it's sort of like not only accepted but it's um you know it's 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 praised yeah it's um you know on social media i see it all the time hustle and grind and then I just, you know, I, I saw um, a, something, somebody said alignment is the new hustle. And I'm like, hmm, wow, that's interesting. Ooh. Gives you something yeah. to think about. But yeah, it's very, you know, it's like you're supposed to just work, 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 work. And um, it's important to make sure that you're listening to your body. I think for um, anybody that has chronic pain, especially with people that suffer from CRPS, to me, I kind of view it as like the monster that lives in my foot and I want to keep it sleeping in there. And if I do something to wake it up, mm. it will start to let me know, hey, I'm awake. Mm. Then if it's like full on awake and angry, it will, it can bring me to my knees. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's good. That, I, that just means I need to be on my knees and pray. <laughs> You know, and I, every day I start my day with before my feet hit the floor, I'm saying a prayer and I'm listing at least three things that I'm grateful for. And it starts, and then I get up and I, I have a few books that I read, um, spiritual books that I read to kind of set the tone for the day. I really think the first hour that we spend our day, it really um, affects the way our, the rest of our day goes, you know, if, if, I mean, and as much as I want to get up and check my email or check my social media, did that post get enough, you know, enough? And was it good? Did people like it? You know, it's that old people pleasing, you know, uh, defect of mine that <laughs> keeps coming into play, um, that I have to really go, no, do not do that. I'm starting my day this way. And it does, it really helps kind of, give you a good start to your day. We hear a lot about that. It's a common success uh, suggestion to have that proactive start to your day. And I know at times in my life, I've kind of dismissed it because I don't like to be regimented or have people tell me what to do or listen to the experts. And I'll, I'll, I'll decide, you know, I, I'm fine. I can do whatever I want and still be productive and focus and all that. But mm -hmm. um, now, now I'm doing my cold plunge every morning and it doesn't take long, but it's something that I've locked into place. And it feels good because it's, first of all, it's proactive and it's g building oh. discipline and resilience because I'm going into 38 degree water, no comparison to dealing with chronic pain or something. But along that same line, when you talk about your three things that you're grateful for, whew, I mean, if you can do every single day and get up and do that, mm -hmm. I think it's going to you know, it's going to address that bad mood and that lingering resentment or whatever's going on in your head or that anxiety about going and checking social media and oh all those my things. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, first of all, that you plunge yourself into cold water like that. That's amazing. <laughs> but, but, um, 
I'm like, oh, maybe I should try that. But oh, it's uh, you, you'll get hooked. You'll well, watch my video on YouTube, and you're, okay. you're going to be ordering up a chest freezer from Home Depot the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, there is the what is it? The cryotherapy, right? Um, and I always wanted to try that, but with CRPS, any extreme cold can flare can mess up. With you it little, can flare yeah. up your CRPS. So what I did was I got in. But I kept my leg up mm-hmm. out of the machine, and it was fine. Well, that'd be a good, good social media picture with Amberly in the machine, and then there's a foot sticking out. Well, that'd I be did. Cool. I posted that, <laughs> and I think people were kind of like, because I had a big bear claw like slipper on my foot yeah. too, and I think people were like, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> but I did try it. But um, but I think um, back to what you said about the gratitude. I really think we are what we focus on and what we believe. And if we have something, uh, you know, going through our head and going, we become that. So if we're thinking about something negative, um, I, those, those thoughts really play into how it affects what, what happens throughout our day or what happens in our life. Um, I think that, you know, if you can find something, even when I was in my hospital bed, there I was stuck in a hospital bed. I had no idea if I was indeed going to be able to, if they were going to be able to save my leg. I was spiraling into a dark depression and it was after I saw an infomercial about how to get that Brazilian butt. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to have a Brazilian butt. I'm all scarred up. I'm, they might take my leg. And I thought, I have got to do something about this because I'm either going to, I got, I've got a choice. I can either go down, keep going down that road of despair, or I can start being grateful for what I do have. I'm alive. I've got a family who loves and supports me. I've got incredible nurses and doctors, and they were like a team. I've got clients and friends and I, and the list went on and I would write down on my list, um, even every nurse that came into the room, that I had a view from the hospital room, that that I was provided food. That's what you wrote down on your gratitude list. And I still have yeah. that little journal. It was a little pad that somebody had brought yeah. me, and I just I still have that list. And when you're grateful, you don't have time. You don't. There's no room for self pity. You know, if you can just turn your thoughts into, and it's something I still have to work on. I mean, and you know, I think. Uh, the other day I was at the gym and I was so, oh, I was just frustrated because my leg was certain. So I wanted to do the elliptical machine and my leg was not cooperating that day and I couldn't do it. And I was oh, so upset and I was like, oh, this leg. And I looked right across from me and there was a girl on the treadmill with no arms. And I thought, you know what? I need to stop complaining and just be grateful for what I am able to do and what I can do. And sometimes it takes somebody like, you know, sometimes my husband has said one day when I was complaining saying, oh, and I said, I hate my leg. And hate's a four letter word in our family. I mean, we're not, we're not, it's a four letter word. And here I said out loud, I hate my leg. I hated that it was scarred. I hated that it didn't work properly. I hated that it gave me so much pain. And he said, you know what? He goes, I can't believe I just heard you say that. He said, you're lucky that you even have your leg. He goes, do you know what the doctors did just to save that leg? And you're saying you hate it. And it was like a, a slap across the face of, oh, my God, I need this is a wake up call. Yes, I need to show my leg a little more love and I need to be grateful that I still have a leg. And then he goes, Yeah. He goes, and you know what? And you should be thankful that you don't have a prosthetic that you have to take off to go swimming that's going to rust. You can just get in the swimming pool. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, yeah, you know. And, you know, I just, one of my really good friends, she was in a motorcycle accident and she, they amputated her leg. And it makes me think of her because she has the prosthetic and, we just worked out together and we're, she's going to go, I'm going to take her on a hike with me and we're going to hike. She only had an accident like eight months ago and she's already moving around fine on her prosthetic. And she's happy. She's not in pain. So she doesn't have a leg. She's got a prosthetic, 
but she's not in pain. So you never know, you know. I guess you can both be grateful or you can both be bitter. Exactly. I, I find that like the technique your husband used upon you and also you're looking over in the gym and seeing a disabled person and recalibrating. Sometimes, I guess either at certain times or certain people are really locked into that position where if you say, hey, think of all the starving children in Africa, they'll, still they'll flip their line. middle finger on you and they, it <laughs> doesn't work on certain people. Mm -hmm. Or a husband coming at you like that after all you've been through, um, it mm -hmm. might not necessarily be effective, but I think he knew it would be effective on you. But the next person might, you know, cry, cry more tears or or lash back because they're not ready to receive that kind of message. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes me think about what we talked about earlier is like everybody's so different. We all learn differently. We're all motivated differently. We're all inspired differently. And that's why I've had it. And, and my pain's different every day. My pain is different. It may be burning pain one day, it might be aching pain another. And that's why I have to go down my list in the toolbox. Like there was mm. one day my husband comes home and I'm sitting at the kitchen table with my pants off and I'm just in tears. And he's like, what's wrong? And why do you have your pants off? <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm in pain and I've tried everything and nothing's working. I've gone down the list and nothing's working. He goes, go stick your leg in the swimming pool. And I did, and it, the cold water, it changed that pain sensation, and it broke that pain cycle. So sometimes it's helpful for someone else to remind us, mm. um, try this, or have you tried that? And that's another reason I think it's so important for people to come together um, to inspire each other, to support each other, because... I feel like I always want, I always want to learn. I always want to grow. And there's so much that I need to learn and I want to grow. And so I think um, on our journey, there's, you know, we can learn from each other and we can support one another. Um, and I just think, um, especially with social media now, you know, I think it's amazing when women can support one another. Um and I just think that it's amazing um, instead of, you know, competition, if we can think of it as community, you know. So your your contribution is telling this powerful story, not only the the accident and the recovery, but you you list yourself as a, a, a survivor of divorce and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And this is this is all weaved into your message in um, True Grit and Grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about the book. Um, well, I wrote the book, it's a memoir, but it's, um, it, it's in the self help and self development section on Amazon. And, um, it was, I wrote the book to really inspire others to claim their resilience and claim their power and to not walk in shame and to, to heal. Um, so I hope they use my experience, um, which, you know, it's called true grit and grace, turning, turning tragedy. And that's a tongue twister. Look at that. Turning that's a, tragedy that's good for into a, triumph. Uh, alliteration, like a memorable thing. Say that five thing. times real fast. But yeah. We got to nail that. <laughs> turning tragedy into t -t 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 triumph. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Did you make yeah. that up or did Yes, actually, I can't take credit for the, the name of my book because, well, kind of. Um, I went, my daughter's a big horseback rider, and I went to the barn one day, and one of the other moms said, girl, I just saw the post you did because I had posted um, an x-ray, and I said, good news, it's only been two years that it's taken for the bone to come completely together, but it's finally grown together. And she goes, I had no idea that's what your leg looked like. She goes, you've got grit and grace. And I said, oh, wow, I think that's one of the nicest things anybody's ever said. I said, what about I'd written my book. I had no idea what to call it. I was like going through different names. I said, what about true grit and grace? Can I use that for my title? She goes, you're welcome. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's where I, so thank you, Amelia. If you listen to this, thank you. Um, but yeah, I really, um, getting ready for the book launch and, um, marketing the book, 
um, I thought, wow, how am I going to do this? How am I going to market it? And uh, Brene Brown's one of my favorite authors. And I said, well, I'm going to look and see what she did. And so... She from Texas, too. She, she is a she Texas is. girl. And I, I, yeah, so we, I love her. And I told my husband, I said, oh, well, this is cool. I was like, she took pictures of her book and she's going to New York to launch hers. I said, and I'm going to New York to launch mine. It's perfect. I'll just do a similar post. And my husband goes, well, don't you think she's going to be upset if she finds out that like you kind of did this a similar post? I said, honey, she is never going to notice someone like me. Well, the day my book published, I was interviewed on the Megyn Kelly Today Show. And that night, my book was in three different categories, a bestseller on Amazon. And in self-help, it was Dr. Wayne Dyer, number one. Number two was Brene Brown. And number three was True Grit and Grace, turning tragedy into triumph. I said at that time. <laughs> so she must have noticed. She had thumbs up to the no, te- Texas I doubt, girls. I, I doubt she noticed. But I was like, oh, my God, my book is sitting right next to Brene Brown's. I took a snap. I took a screenshot of that because I was in shock. I'm, I'm still sure, in shock. Uh, Brene will be listening to the show, so we'll shout out. We want to get you on as well, Brene. Yeah, but shout right now out. we got Amber Lee and uh, <laughs> props to the Texas girls. Incredible. <laughs> uh, so you talk about having to tone down that competitive intensity and that go, go, go mindset. I talk about this a lot in my athletic experience where I realized after a while that pushing harder made me go slower and make bad decisions and get frustrated and discouraged. And I had to kind of balance that competitive intensity with some intuition and mindfulness, like Mm -hmm. you say. So is there, is there an art here where um, if you're being grateful and mindful all the time, do you have a fear that you're going to lose your edge and uh, not be so successful on social media or on your book tour or whatever your your hardcore goals and objectives are? No, I think sometimes if you start to think that way, I have to remind myself, let it go. Just let it go. When you start thinking, maybe I'm going to lose my edge, maybe I'm going to And, you know, first of all, my husband even says, I think there is something about growing up in Texas and with growing up with a lot of grit. And my husband will go, oh, don't go Texas on me back. And my nickname is Texas because there is something in deep inside us. And I think we all have this um, inside us, this this grit. Um, And it's finding out how to really... um, claim it and use it. And, but it is, you know, even when I was training 12 clients a day, now I don't, I don't train that many clients a day. I try to practice what I preach. And my philosophy when I was hardcore into training was still work smarter, not harder. Because like you said, you can, it's, it's about, um, finding the right way to do it. You can work harder and harder and harder, but if you're not working smarter, it's not going to get you anywhere. Like we talked about, like before the, the show, um, before we started uh, recording about, you know, social media is, well, you can write a book and that's 10% of it. And the 90% of it is getting out there. If no, if you write a book and nobody knows about it, then what, What's the, you know, reason for writing it? <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think um, uh, it is working smarter, not necessarily harder. It is that that balancing act. So is the chronic pain kind of a governor where this will flare up when you're overstressed, not sleeping enough, uh, losing your grateful mindset and, and getting caught up? I mean, she's, we're, we're here in Los Angeles, which is the, the rat race, uh, mm-hmm. one of the ultimate rat race locations. And I find I don't live here anymore. I grew up here. I'm, I spend a lot of time here, but I can sense that vibe in a busy, vibrant city where there's so many great things to do and so much stimulation, but it's also, uh, it can lure you into um, an imbalanced lifestyle pretty easily. Oh, well, when I was in New York, you could just feel the energy. It is really, I thought LA had a lot of energy. Yeah. New York was like, I didn't even want to sleep. Uh, but that's, I, that's the tough one is like late at night. I'll, I'll take the LA energy all day long. And then at 10 o'clock, let's, let's shut it down. But like you go out and I remember 
uh, arriving at 2 a.m. to my hotel at Times Square, and it might as well have been, you know, 6 p.m. There's yeah. there's no sense of any any slowdown. No, no. Um, yeah, it was it was just the energy there was incredible. Um, but you know, I think for me, CRPS is baffling. It it just when I think I know, just when I think I got it, I don't, and it'll come up and surprise me. I was at the gym yesterday and I was doing an exercise and it started flaring up. It started, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm doing a glute exercise. Why is it I'm not using, you know, using my leg necessarily, although I guess I was a little, but I never know. Some days I can go for a, an hour hike and I'm okay the rest of the day. But if I have to walk through the mall for 10 minutes, I'm dead. And so I think the key is finding out what you can do. And for me, I always like really want to push that limit. Like it feels so good to run downhill on that hike. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I just want to run a little bit. And I was insane. Like I looked up the definition of insanity and that's who I was. Like I was doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. I was running down the mountain, causing a flare up and it would get a little better and I would do the same thing. Mm. But for me, I kind of have to learn the hard way. I have to like learn by really going through it. And that is one of the reasons I wrote my book. I want people to learn lessons that I have learned the hard way, maybe through my experience so they don't have to go through that experience. Wow. I like that. It would be nice, especially thinking in terms of our kids or something to learn lessons of life mm -hmm. just from verbal storytelling rather than going out there and getting, getting that, uh, that hard way. Yeah. That I, yeah. I feel like there's something inside us that, uh, insists on, finding out the hard way at times. And mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there's, maybe there's a certain value to it. Like, you know, we want to go get, uh, mired in a, a defeatist mindset for a while and then wake up and maybe have more receptivity to going and, and buying true grit and grace and reading it. Whereas today we might be too full of ourselves to, to be receiving the message in your book. Well, Oh, I like that. I think, um, a gift that I've been given is, you know, I was always a uh, a very independent and I considered myself a humble person. Let me tell you, this whole experience has humbled me. And I think it's important to remain humble because when you're humbled, you continue to grow. Whew. I guess you should be on the Get Over Yourself podcast then with, oh, a, with a line like that. Oh, get over yourself, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's a challenge. <laughs> I, and I love how your message is very powerful, but unlike some uh, performers out there, you're couching every time saying that you're still working on it. It's still a challenge. And I'm trying to do the same myself when I say get over yourself. I'm trying to get over myself every day. But as soon as we think we're we're there and we're modeling true grit and grace at all times and smiling for the cameras, um, mm -hmm. that's when I want to look deeper. And, and some of this second guessing of our culture and the, the message that's out there is that people have it together all the time. Shout out to the Kardashians, our neighbors here. Yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, there's too much of that and there's not enough of just just getting getting real about this thing. Well, you know, I remember the first time I did a post and I admitted that this I have this nerve disease. It was hard. You know, I remember the first time I did a post and I showed a picture of my legs. I had a friend of mine that said, "Well, it just looks like your life is perfect." You've got the perfect husband, the two beautiful girls, you know, you have a career, everything is good. And I said, really? Thanks, I said, friend. I said, thank you for that, because she inspired me to do a post. Oh. And it was the first post I ever did showing my legs and I was having a flare up. And I kind of said, so this is what I deal with. This is actually what my leg really looks like. And I'm having a flare up right now, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in the bathtub with some Epsom salts and hopefully it'll calm down and tomorrow's a new day and each day we get to begin again. And 
that got more engagement because people can relate. Oh, yeah. You know, there's um, a quote that I hear that I like that um, flawed still worthy because I mean, I got a lot of fly, flaws, but if you believe you're still worthy and you have a mindset of good things can happen and will happen, it's a game changer. And I think um, it's, you know, it's not, no, my life's far from perfect, you know, far from perfect. And that's one thing that um, I think is just being your authentic self, not trying to be, you know, someone else or be someone else, just being you and embracing who you are. For me, it was embracing my vulnerabilities, embracing my scars, embracing the pain, surrendering to it. Um, you know, growing up in Texas where it was hide your crazy and be a lady, it was something I had to learn. It was like I was used to, no, suck it up and don't show that I'm in pain. You know, smile, you're dancing, the show must go on. Um, all that I had to retrain myself and go, you know what? It's okay to be vulnerable because you learn and you grow and you can develop strength from your vulnerabilities. And so that was really hard. That was a hard lesson for me to learn. Uh, why are people so afraid of that? I think for me, I was afraid it made me look weak or less than, or I wasn't able to do something. Um, uh, you know, God forbid I look weak. I didn't want to look weak. Um, and for me, it was, I didn't want to feel like a burden for me. It was, I didn't, um, want to admit that I needed help. And for me, it's cause I am so darn stubborn. And I had to learn that, well, look, I needed help. I still need a lot of help. And thank goodness I have a support system around me and my husband being the biggest support. Um, you know, things aren't always perfect in our marriage, but I have to say he's put up with a lot. I mean, he's been a, a good man that has been there every step of the way throughout every surgery and dealing with me with when I have not felt good about myself. He accepted the way I looked long before I was OK with it. You know, and so um, I think it's wonderful when you can learn from your partner to be a better person. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm just hoping that my book, it, it shifts people's perspective and it helps them grow and learn and heal and be their authentic self and embrace their self. True grit and grace. Turning triumph into tragedy so we can go get that. We're, no, no. We're See, tongue twister. Oh, turning tragedy into <laughs> triumph. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I maybe we it. should edit that out so the show can be perfect. Oh, uh, well. Yeah, or, or I don't there, know. Yeah. No. Uh, True grit and grace, turning tragedy into triumph. How's that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Such a nice voice Just, there. You know. <laughs> so we can go get the book. How else can we follow you? Oh, I would love to connect with other people. That's been the biggest gift of this whole book journey is connecting with so many people. And you can find me, AmberlyLago.com. If you sign it's up for It's a good website. My... Stunning. Yeah. It was, oh, I mean, thank you. really touching. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to Cousin Babs for introducing us. She said, you should talk to this friend of mine. She's oh. in Woodland Hills. I'm like, all right, all right. People do that all the time. Let me see your website. Wow. Yeah. Oh, thank Great you. Great story. Great to have you on too. Thank you. It's, you know, websites are always a work in progress, but yeah, I, I love to connect with people. I sent, if you sign up for my newsletter, I send out a weekly little dose of inspiration and on Instagram, I'm Amberly Lago Motivation. Uh, Twitter is Amberly Lago and I love to connect with people on LinkedIn as well. Okay. Go do it right now. Connect. She wants to connect with you. Thanks, Amberly Lago. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on your show. I really appreciate it. Dum, 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 dum. Let's talk about ancestral supplements. If you're into ancestral health, primal paleo, keto, you know the importance of consuming these unique agents contained in bone marrow, in the nose to tail, organ meats, liver, kidney, all that stuff, the great bone broth benefits. Well, how's it going? 
For me, since years ago when Dr. Kate Shanahan asserted the importance of these wonderful nutritional benefits that you can't get elsewhere, eh, not too good. I don't know how to cook a liver or a kidney, but now your problems are solved forever when you go to ancestralsupplements.com, a wonderful company filled with people who are living the dream, walking their talk, and bottling up the purest, cleanest sources of grass-fed organ meats, kidney, liver bone marrow, all in these wonderful capsules. I dump them in my smoothie every day. I'm healthy. I don't have to worry. It's an incredible dietary boost. And this is so different from swallowing a bunch of those synthetic vitamins and those giant bottles from the big box stores. Highly questionable health practice. This stuff is the real deal. Grass-fed organ meats, pure as can be, ancestralsupplements.com.